Hi everyone! Before we dive into this week's episode, please check out our promo of the week. I'm Paige, the host of Reverie True Crime. I tell stories of helpless victims, vicious killers, predators watching their prey before they strike, survivors, petty crimes, people we think we know who do the unthinkable, and the dangers that lurk not only in the dead of night, but in plain sight and the light of day. Every once in a while, I'll also tell stories of the frightening paranormal, elusive cryptids, haunted locations, and conspiracies that may be silly or thought-provoking. You can listen to Reverie True Crime wherever you're listening to this podcast. Feel free to follow me on Twitter at Reverie Crime Pod. Facebook, Instagram, and even Tumblr at Reverie True Crime. Remember, stay safe, be aware of your surroundings at all times, and take care. Hi, I'm Laura. And I'm Jill. And this is Crime Divers. Welcome to today's episode. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us again for another episode. And as we like to do at the start of each episode, we like to highlight a missing person. So Jill, I believe you have one to do this week. Yes, I do. I think this one's a little bit different. Different? Who can be different? Yeah, um, I think she's been abducted. Oh, okay. There's a possible abduction. Right, so, okay. The lady's name is Betty Hayes. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's from Missouri. Um... So I'm looking at two different missing posters. So one of them says that she was abducted um, uh, from her house. Her locked door was forcefully broken. Mm-hmm. Um, and apparently it's been reported that Betty has dementia, but she was not, her family says, no, she wasn't. She hasn't been diagnosed with dementia. Right. So she didn't wander off. Uh-huh. She has been abducted. Okay. So, um, so she was from Paris, Missouri. And she's been missing since the 16th of December, 2021. Um, she, uh, Betty is 88. She's 5 foot 2. She weighs 86 pounds. She has grey hair and blue eyes. Um, so I'm just going to read what it says on this missing poster. Mm-hmm. So Betty L. Hayes went missing from Paris, Missouri on December the 16th, 2021 at 9.30pm. Betty was last seen at... 17040 Route C Holiday MO on Thursday night. Betty's vehicles are still at her home address and she is not known to be travelling in any personal vehicle. Betty does not suffer from dementia. Um, as I said, I've already said she's she's 88, she's five foot two, 86 pounds, grey hair and blue eyes. She was last known to be wearing a dark stocking hat and dark coat, possibly black. Right. But on her uh, missing poster that I've seen that her family put up, Mm -hmm. it says that she was last seen wearing dark plum dress pants, um, a plaid blazer and a hat. And all of these items that are in her house, she was caught in surveillance camera, uh, surveillance camera shopping, grocery shopping. Uh Uh-huh. Um, that afternoon. So they're saying that's the last time she was seen in she, public. Yeah, she was seen. She's obviously went home mm-hmm. um, and then she spoke to her daughter um, at half past nine that night. Right, okay. So that was the last contact. That was had. Yeah, so that's why they're saying she's been missing from half past nine that right. night. They, her family believe that she didn't make it to bed right, that okay. night, that her house has been broken and, uh, and right. somebody's t- taken her. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you have any information regarding Betty's disappearance or you know of her whereabouts, please call 911 immediately, contact your nearest law enforcement agency or call the Monroe County, Missouri Sheriff's Department at 660-327-4060 or the Missouri State Highway Patrol Missing Persons 
Clearing house, that was a mouthful. Mm-hmm. Uh, 573-526-6178 or toll free at 866-362-6422. So I will put uh, um, all that information in the show notes. And there's a $10,000 reward um, leading to the arrest and conviction of you know, people or persons responsible. So, yeah, I'll put the missing poster on social media and if anybody has any information or even if you can just share it, that would be fantastic. Just share and just raises the awareness, that's all we ask. Thank you. So, we would just like to take a minute to talk about Patreon. We do mention it every week, but we have had some listeners asking us to explain exactly what it is. So, Patreon is an exclusive platform for listeners to pay their favourite creators a monthly fee in exchange for bonus content, which includes ad-free episodes, early access to our weekly episodes, and two Patreon-only episodes a month. We have three tiers, the first one being only a pound a month, and that will give you ad-free episodes and early access to our weekly episodes. A lot of listeners sign up to this tier just for general support to their favourite podcast. Yeah. So the second tier is £3 a month and that will give you one bonus episode a month plus obviously you still get the benefits of the the £1 tier as well. And lastly we have a £5 tier and that gives you two bonus episodes a month and after three months we'll send you just a wee gift to show you our appreciation. Um, And obviously you also get the benefits of the other tiers as well. It only takes a couple of minutes to sign up. There's no contract and no minimum commitment. So if you would like to sign up, head on over to patreon.com forward slash crime divers. We hope to see you there. Yep, that would be fantastic. Brilliant. Yep, so today is a lot of sword. Yep, we have a lot of sword. Yep, so where in the world are we? Uh, we are in Australia. Okay, we're going down under. We are going down under today. And what's the name of your case? It's called The Woman Behind the Mask. Oh, that sounds interesting. Now, I'm going to give you a little trigger warning. It is quite horrific. Okay. Um, Yeah, it's not pleasant. Well, you know. I mean, the crime case really is pleasant. I, yeah, I was, you just took the words right out of my mouth. But I found this one really quite horrific with the, what well, basically what happens. Can I go home? You are home. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. no you can't <laughs> okay you just want to dive in then yeah we'll just get diving into this one so Dana Vull- Vullen was born into a tight knit family with two older sisters and a twin brother she and her family lived in the small community of Coolin Island off the coast of Western Australia during during their early uh, her early childhood so the family then relocated to Perth when Dana was six years old so Dana, she was described as a cheeky, confident kid. Um, she'd built up a rich network of friends throughout her time at school. And on completing high school, Dana enrolled in a Bachelor of Communications, uh, where she graduated with a major in advertising, um, as well as a Bachelor of Business majoring in management. So she done quite well. Yeah. So Dana, she described herself as outgoing, loud, assertive, fun. Some people would say she was wild. Her uh, sister said that she was so kind and very generous with her time, though, um, and she always wanted to help people out, and, you know, she was always there if you needed her. So she was actually quite, you know... Sounds nice, nice enough. Yeah, just a bit of a, a wild, a wild, a wild girl. Wanted to have a good time. Same. <laughs> <laughs> she always took great pride in her appearance. In her words, she said she looked immaculate all day, every day. Okay, not same. <laughs> Says, says we sit here in my Harry Potter jammies. Well, I'm just about to tell you that she said that she wouldn't, you would never catch her in trackies or joggers. Her outfits always had to be a little bit different and she had to stand out from the crowd. She liked the way she looked a lot. The reason I'm emphasising it quite a bit is because you'll understand when I tell you actually what happens to her. Okay. Um, so she got, you know, as a, she had good looks, she got a lot of attention from men. She said that she was always getting hit on and it was just the norm for her. She just was used to it. Um, but, you know, it wasn't all about her looks. She did actually have brains as well. And after she graduated, she started working for her big sister, an office refurbishment company. 
Her sister had two young children, so she, you know, she was enjoying being an auntie and with the hope that one day she would have a family of her own. But at the moment, you know, she just wanted to have some fun. There were two sides to her, you know, a woman with a generous spirit, but also a wild child. And, you know, she even admitted that she did actually dabble in a bit of drugs here and there as well. So when she was 25... Um, in 2011, she was at a New Year's Eve party at Perth's Crown Casino. So Dana spent part of the night chatting to a man called Edin Handanovich. He was a fitness instructor. Um, he, uh, he's of, he was of Macedonian descent. Um, and they spoke for about half an hour. So Dana said that he didn't hit on her. He wasn't sleazy. Um, and there was no like physical contact. You know, like kissing or anything like that. He just told Dana that he was divorced but it turns out that he was actually lying. He wasn't divorced. He had only recently separated from his wife Natalia. Um, she was the mother of his child and it turned out that Dana had, like her and Dana had mutual friends and um, they'd even met once so you know Dana had no reason to suspect that she would suddenly become Natalia's sworn enemy. Ooh. So Natalia was desperate to reconcile with Eden. Um, and she discovered that he had been seen talking to Dana on this New Year, this New Year's Eve's party. Um, and apparently later, um, Dana and Eden, they'd met for a second time. But again, nothing, nothing had happened or anything like that. Um, you know, there was no relationship or... T- were they just friends? Well, I don't even think they were friends, to be honest. It doesn't sound like they were really that much. I mean, they just had this half-hour conversation at a party... Um, I'm not sure what the second encounter was about, but it certainly wasn't anything romantically or anything like that. So Natalia, you know, she became enraged about this. She was not happy. So Dana had a phone call from Natalia on the 26th of January, 2012, which was actually on Australia Day. And just so anybody, in case they don't know what Australia Day is, the official National Day of Australia, it marks the 1788 landing of the first fleet at Sydney Cove. And in present day, Australia um, celebrations aim to reflect the diverse society and landscape of the nation and are marked by community and family events. They also have official community awards um, and citizenship can't say that word, ceremonies welcoming new members of the Australian community. Okay. So it was just over three weeks since Dana had met Eden at the you know, the New Year's Eve party. And Natalia had said on the phone call that her and Eden were together. And she started being abusive, calling Dana, quote, a fucking slut. Lovely. <laughs> and that she was dead. She had no idea who... She had no idea who she'd made enemies with. She's, you know... Basically, so sorry, them... Natalia was basically saying, Dana, you've got no idea who you've just made enemies with. All right. I was getting, um, I was getting a bit confused there. I don't yeah, understand what I know. I, I kind of didn't say that properly, <laughs> yeah. Um, and that Natalia, she said that she was going to kill her and ruin her pretty little face. Oh. So in the weeks that followed, Dana received loads more phone calls. Um, and her friend, Luke Richards, said that he overheard some of the phone calls. And he said he heard them say, you know, we're watching you, um, you know, just like just like really horrible things. He was overheard on this phone call. So I think Dana like put it on like loudspeaker so that he could yeah. sort of hear what was going on. Um, he, he was at Dana's place at the time and he witnessed about a dozen threatening phone calls. And Dana put, I said, someone on loudspeaker so that he could hear them. Luke asked um, who, like who it was. So Dana explained... Um, and said Natalia thought she was sleeping with her husband, which she hadn't at all. Like, she right. hadn't done anything. Yeah. Like, nothing had happened at all. So she's just, like, jumped to conclusions. Like, oh, yeah. Her husband has spoken to another girl, mm-hmm. and she's just put two and two together and came up with 100. Yeah, exactly. She's just went, like, right off the rails here about it. And yeah. I mean, as I said, I mean, to me, it doesn't sound like anything. I mean, very often you can go to, like, a party or if you're on a night out and you can speak to men... Yeah, you're not allowed to speak to me- members of the the people members. What's the word? Members of the public. The, them mm. no the opposite sex. Well, yeah, it's just it just seems that you know like they obviously had a conversation and as I said, I mean there was nothing in it at all. It was just two people having a conversation. Um. So Dana said that she just wanted to explain to Natalia that she hadn't done anything wrong. Ed had hadn't even hit on her. Um. Anything like you hadn't called Dana. Or, you know they hadn't seen each other. So. You know, she just wanted to sort of get that across to her that that was the case. But as most friends would do, Luke, 
you know, counselled her and, and he told her, you know, not to stress about it. You know, nothing was going to happen. You know, don't get paranoid about it. And, he, you know, he tried to make her feel good about herself. So he was just being like a nice friend and trying yeah. to say, like, don't stress, you know. She's just obviously going off on one. I'm sure it'll die down. Yeah, well, yeah. You know, she's obviously just... He wasn't thinking too much. He wasn't looking too much. No, I mean, it. I certainly couldn't... I mean, what I'm about to tell you that happens, I mean, you could never have imagined that that would happen. Um... Am I, I've got a feeling it's going to escalate. Yes, it is about to escalate. So I'm going to tell you now, okay. basically, what happens. So two days later, after the phone calls when Luke was there, um, on the, it was the 16th of February 2012, and it was just after 6am, Dana was um, you know, sleeping in her ground floor apartment in Riverdale. So Natalia and a male accomplice, they were breaking in to her apartment. Oh, so she God. was actually on the ground floor because... I've, basically I've, this is a documentary that I've seen and you actually see like because obviously you know Dana shows you like where they broke in so basically they had to jump over sort of a wall and then she's got like a sort of balcony mm-hmm. outside her, her apartment so they obviously climb up they climb, climbed up the railings there and um, so yeah they, so then they got in through her back doors because she had like back sort of patio doors on the balcony so Natalia she had been high on meth amphetamine for most of the past 24 hours. That can't be good. No, exactly. So the lock on Dana's back door was broken and, you know, Natalia and her male accomplice broke in. They woke Dana with a start and saw, you know, then Dana woke up and she saw Natalia just standing over her. Oh my God. I mean, I would absolutely shit myself yeah, if that ever happened. Totally. Yeah, totally. Because you're just not expecting it, are you? No. You feel like you should be safe when you're on home. So, I mean, that would just be totally, totally scary. I hear noises in my house and I like I'm, when I'm in bed and I'm scared to open my eyes in case somebody's standing over me. Well, no, I mean, so to actually have somebody standing over you must be the most terrifying thing. Oh, definitely. Because, like. I mean, she lived on her own in this apartment. You yeah. Know, she had anybody there with her. She was just on her own. So she woke up, as I said, she saw Natalia standing there and she was like, what are you doing here? Like, mm. What are you doing here? Um. So Natalia was like starting running around and saying, asking, where is he? Where is he? And Dan's like, where's who? Like, who? Um, and Natalia's like, well, where's Eden? And so Dan was like, what are you talking about? Like, mm, like, what the fuck? Yeah, he's like, he's not here. Like, if, I don't know what you're on about. So Natalia must have been like totally off her face on drugs and just clearly and thought that Eden was with Dan. So, <laughs> so let me get this straight. Eden mm-hmm. has spoken to this girl. Dana, yeah. For half an hour at a party, uh-huh. and then they've had some sort of yeah, interaction I'm, later on, which, which I'm we not don't. sure what it is. Though. Yeah, and this woman has decided to break into her apartment mm-hmm. because she doesn't know where her husband is, and yeah. just assumes that yeah. that's where he is. Exactly. It's crazy, okay. Isn't it? Yeah. Okay. I just I just don't get how you can yeah. go that like that far. Yeah. Not with that. That's with what that. I, that's what I'm like. How do you get from there? To there, you yeah, know, like exactly with with not much of an evidence of anything really. Yeah, going on. I mean, like I, mean, I don't think you should be breaking into anybody's apartment, <laughs> regardless of what situ- the situation is. But certainly from what's happened, that doesn't warrant that at all. At least have some evidence, well, have like, some like, proof, exactly. So, and still don't break into that person's apartment. But at least if you're going to accuse somebody of something, oh, yeah. have have the evidence to back it up. Exactly. So, of course, Dana started, you know, she started to walk over to her front door to open it to tell him to get out. Mm-hmm. She was like, you know, what are you... you know, is the guy in? Yeah, so there's a guy in the, in this apartment. But did she know that? Yeah, yeah, actually. She see the two of them. Yeah. All right, I didn't know if it was just... Um... No, no, there's, there's, there's a guy. I don't know who the guy is, though. Right. Um, there was no mention of what his name is. It's just her male accomplice. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, so Dana started to walk over to the front door to, to open it to tell him to get out. But Natalia then lit up and started to smoke crystal meth. So Dan, Dana said to Natalia, like, you know, get out. Yeah. Get out of my apartment. Um, so Natalia then grabbed the methylated um, spirits bottle, which is like a meth lamp. So it's obviously because she was like still on the drugs. So she had all the equipment. With yeah. Her. So she grabbed it. This, apparently this lamp has like a constant flame on it. Um, and she started waving it about, saying, "Tell me where he is. I'm I'm gonna set you on fire." And Dan was like, "What for?" I was like, "I don't, I don't know what I've done here. Like, what for?" Um, and without replying, Natalia twisted the lid off and doused Dana with the methylated spirit. <gasps> oh God! So this is where it gets a bit. Can I go home now? Bad, yeah. So just, just a trigger warning for anybody. This is where it gets a bit. Okay. Awful. 
So Dana was then engulfed with flames. Oh my goodness. She cupped her hands on her face and just started screaming. The moment, you know, basically the moment she was on fire, she was screaming. Oh. Natalia and her accomplice, they laughed. Oh my goodness. They like just, how? Like, yeah. Oh. They, they just laughed at her. They you would think, sorry, I just interrupted you there. You would think that it's a, it's a horrific thing to do, mm-hmm. but you'd think maybe once you saw that person in flames, that would kind of like give you a shock yeah, and like bring, sort you, of, bring you to your senses. Yeah, bring you to, and like, oh my god, oh shit, fuck, mm-hmm. I need to, we need to get this under control, like, we need to, we need to get her help. But to actually like laugh, mm-hmm. yep, they laughed, they watched her burn. Oh my god. They laughed again, and then they ran out of the apartment. That's horrendous. Mm-hmm. Awful. Dana said the pain was unbelievable. She ran into the kitchen to get water to pour over herself. She poured a bucket over her, but with a chemical burn, apparently you're just constantly on fire. Yeah. Um, it just keeps on burning into your oh. skin. Oh, God. I know. So she said that she remembers opening her front door and just screaming for help. Just like, you know, someone please help oh. me. Because, I mean, luckily, you know, she's in an apartment block. So yeah, so she's got through. people close by. Yeah, so thankfully a neighbour was alerted and called for an ambulance. Um, and another neighbour called Dennis Erickson rushed Dana back into her apartment and into her bathroom and put her under the shower. Um, she was just sitting in the shower with the water on top of her and she was just screaming. Mm. I mean, screaming. That must be excruciating. And she said that every drop just felt like it was acid burning into her skin. Oh. She was just in so much pain. I mean, I can't even... No, nah, can't even imagine. imagine. I, mean, I mean, you know what it's like just to burn yourself, like, you know, in a hot tap or whatever, just a tiny little bit. I mean, that's... Yeah, yeah. I sober mean, enough, oh. never mind actually your whole body covered. Um, So she, she said that, you know, Dennis was so nice and kind to her and he, he stayed very calm. You know, he how, asked, how could you say calm? I know, I mean, he asked like, good, good for him. Like, I would be absolutely... Pan- I think I'd be absolutely hopeless in an emergency like that. Mm. I would be hopeless. I mean, I And I would know. be freaking out. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how I would react. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, he's just stayed very calm. He asked her her name. He told her everyone would be okay. And, you know, the help was coming. Oh, good for you know, him. So, at least she had somebody there with her. Um, so, amazingly, the hospital was actually literally a four-minute drive from where Dana's home was. So, and, and apparently it was... All, well, not apparently, it is also Australia's best burned unit. Oh, um, so even victims, I don't know if you remember the Bali bombing um, they, it was treated there. It was a bombing. It must have been a few years before that. But anyway, so basically it was a very, very good burns. Yeah. In hospital. So I mean, she lived within four mile, uh, four minutes of that. So thank God. Yeah. Um, so when doctors first saw Dana, they did not think that she would survive. Mm. Um, she was immediately placed in an induced coma, keeping her infection free was crit- critical to keeping her alive. Um, I actually I have actually seen pictures of her like mm-hmm. after it, and I, I mean, <laughs> I don't want to look at pictures. Uh, you know, it, I'm gonna horrible. have to look at pictures, aren't I? Because mm. I'm gonna look the case up yeah, when I'm putting I mean, it on social media. I don't. It's horrible. I mean, I, honestly, it's it's not nice to look at at all. I mean, it is really, really, really is. Horrible. I can't even imagine what it'd be like to look at. Just no, it's oh. it's not good. So. You know, her family had no idea what was going on at this point. Her sister had tried to call her, um, and then while they were dri- while she was driving in her car, she actually heard a news report about a fire in River- Riverdale involving a woman with blonde hair. And she, because she was in the car with her husband and her two kids, and she was like, what if that's Dana? Because she, you know, blonde hair, she lives in Riverdale, she couldn't get a hold of her on the phone. Yeah. She was obviously starting to think, oh my God, what if yeah. that's her? Um. And her husband was like, oh, you know, don't be silly, don't be silly. Because of course she would. Yeah. You know, you're probably not thinking it's going to be here, but she was... It's one of these things that would, you know, you'd always be like, no, of course not. It's not going to happen to to anybody we know. Exactly. But of course, you know, her sister, she screamed, she was like, screamed at him to turn the car around. So, you know, they could go and check. Mm -hmm. And when they arrived at Dana's apartment, there was just police, forensics, police and forensic everywhere. Um, Dana's mum, Vera, she was actually on duty working as a nurse's assistant at the hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, and her sister, sorry, her sister is, is called Svetlana. Um, she rang her mum um, and broke the news to her. So she just literally ran down the stairs to intensive care. Um, 
And she said she didn't even recognise mm. her own child. I was just going to say that. I, and she wouldn't, she wouldn't recognise her, her. her own child. She actually almost said it was like looking at, at Jesus on a cross because obviously she was just like... Because the picture that you see, she's just lying with her hands out, you know, like sort of... Cross uh, on a cross, yeah. Yeah, and just like covered in like the bandages and stuff. And oh. it's just honestly, it's, it's awful. It's, it's heartbreaking to see that she's like that, especially... You know, I was saying to her, like, you know, she was such a pretty girl and, yeah. you know, she was really into her looks and stuff like that. And to have that happen to her, I mean, <sighs> honestly. So they didn't actually really expect her to survive. I mean, you know, they, they really thought she would probably die. Yeah. Um. So they, you know, they basically took it hour by hour to see if her body could keep fighting, which this went on for days. Like, they were just like, right, do the next hour. Yeah. Right, we've got to do a couple hours. They just really weren't expected to survive. I know that we've done a case before about, because it's one about somebody had been set on fire. Remember they yeah, died? that was a Patreon one. That was, oh. um, I think that was Jessica Chambers. Was that what it was? Yeah, I remember. So she didn't survive that, did she? Yeah. Um, so I, I was quite shocked, to be honest. Yeah. Um, so at first, you know, the, the police, they couldn't make sense of what happened because obviously they, they knew nothing at this point. Like, they absolutely knew nothing of what happened. They, all they knew was that this girl was on fire, had mm. been set on fire. They didn't know how it happened, what happened. Um, so they actually asked Svetlana to make an appeal, um, you know, like on telly to see if they could find out any information. So that appeal uh, did eventually lead them to Natalia Demetroska, who mm-hmm. we already know about. Yeah. <laughs> um, police began actually secretly recording um, her mobile phone calls and many of them were to her husband, Eden. So in one call, she told Eden that she was going to dye her hair from blonde to brunette because she was blonde originally. Right. But she dyed it to brunette. And one of the phone calls was from her mother saying that police were here and not to come home, which I was a bit conflicted about that because I was like, if she knows that, her mum obviously knows that she's done something, but she's, I'm like, like, you're actually. Yeah, but does, does she know what she's done though? Um, I don't actually know hundred percent if she knew at that point, but I mean the fact that she was telling her to stay away from home, she must have known she'd done something. I would say because why else? Because otherwise, yeah, the mum would be like, "Oh, the police are here," but I don't know why. You know. But the mum might have just been like, the mum's not going to be thinking that her daughter's done something that like that. She probably just like she's maybe thinking I don't know. She knew that she was into drugs maybe. and stuff, but she's maybe thinking oh, it's just a drug related thing or something. Yeah, I like, just assumed that she was telling her not to come home because she knew what happened. I mean, I might be wrong. Well, this, but well, yeah, of course we don't know. I mean, it doesn't state. Where if 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 her mum didn't know, but I just assumed that maybe she did, and that's why she was telling her not to come home. And I was thinking, imagine like you know that poor girl that's lying in her bed, and yeah, but we don't know if the no. mum knew or not. No, so, but true. if she did know, then that is absolutely horrific, mm-hmm. you know. But yeah, yeah, as we can't. But I think her family must know because uh, the next family tells like eight eight days after the attack, Natalia was overheard telling her brother that she was on her way to Perth Airport. It looked like she was fleeing the country heading to Istanbul and on to Macedonia. Um, so Natalia, she actually had no, you know, she had no idea she was being pursued at this point. She had no idea the police yeah. were on her at all. Um, she left her luggage and she headed straight towards the terminal where her flight... So basically, sorry, so she got to the the uh, airport, she dumped her car. Um, and I actually think... Oh, I can't remember now because I I, rem- I think I don't know if she maybe did get a letter or something because she there was a, a sudden no no that's what sorry so she was running late for her flight that's what it was sorry so she was obviously running late for her flight so she was running that late that she just didn't, didn't even take her luggage with her All right. so she'd obviously got because she was on the phone to her brother and her brother was like you know your flight's at this time or whatever like you need to hurry up so she literally just dumped her car didn't even pick her luggage cause I, think, I don't think she had time to go and check her check luggage her, in yeah. because the flight was like literally boarding so obviously she had no idea that she was being pursued so she headed straight towards the terminal where the flight was already boarding. And luckily the police had managed to get to the airport just moments before her. So they were like lying in wait for her. So the police, um, you know, they actually arrested her as she was on her way to the check-in desk. Mm. Um, so, you know, they got her thankfully before she managed to board this flight to uh, Macedonia. Right. So 10 days after being set on fire, um, back to Dana, she woke from her coma. Um, Dana actually said that she had quickly come to an acceptance that she was never going to be the same again. She said her skin won't ever be able to breathe again and she can't ever sweat, which causes her to overheat constantly. Um, She's constantly itchy, but she can't scratch. And in her words, she said, the itch is a bitch. 
<laughs> I like that. <laughs> I mean, you know, considering I can that, imagine I, the itch would be a bit. Yeah. I just thought that was quite funny. For somebody who like suffers from eczema, I know what itching mm. is like, and itching is a bitch. But for that, mm. that was just oh, yeah. I can't even imagine. I know she had to learn to walk and talk again, and it turned out that sixty four percent of her body was burned. Um, so she was at because in the documentary that I saw, she was wearing this like body mask. So I could I, I could describe it as kind of like a balaclava mm. on her face. Yeah. Um, so obviously there's just like a hole for her lips. Yeah, I've seen other burn victims. Yeah, the she obviously had a whole like sort of bodysuit on her, um, and and that document like you know she wasn't, she was asked you know about if she would sort of take it off or what like not if she take it off but does she take it off basically mm. and she was like that she doesn't want to take it off, um as she said that you know she was known for her looks and she looks a, she's a bit embarrassed. Oh. Um, and she's not completely used to the way that she looked yet, so she felt really ugly. So that's why oh. she she kind of wore it basically because she didn't want to scare people as well, you know, mm. and just for herself because she just wasn't confident in herself. Yeah. She was somebody that was so confident in her looks mm-hmm. and stuff that she was just like, no, I need I need to wear this. What a shame! I know it's absolutely awful. I mean, you know, she, the, in her doc in the documentary, she was just so she just came across as so amazing and brave, and I was like. How? How? Yeah. You know, after that, how you know? How could that trauma that you've been through and you were still you know sitting there and you know just get try to get on with her life and stuff and try not to let it, you know stop her from living her life and I just thought you know what hats off to you you just good for her yeah totally that must be so hard to do mm, it definitely does so Natalie Dimitroska she was sentenced to seventeen years behind bars, um she will be eligible for parole in 2027 mm. so in six years time um but she was convicted of which i thought five years time sorry five years time you're 2022, 2022 now so is, yeah, five <laughs> years time, um but i thought this was awful i mean good obviously been convicted but she was, what she was convicted of was grievously bodily harm with intent so it wasn't even like attempted murder i was just gonna say that to me that I would have thought that would have been attempted murder. Well, it seemed like attempted murder to me. I mean, mm. I feel like, so that's why I was kind of like, oh my God, I can't believe she only got 17 years because mm. I think she should have got a hell of a lot more for that. But then when yeah. I realised what the charge was, I mean, obviously, because cause actually for that charge, it was actually the longest sentence in Australian history mm. for grievous for that, the harm with yeah. intent. That's the longest sentence. So, I mean, she did obviously get a really good sentence for that charge. For, yeah. But I just thought, God... I, I mean, wonder why she wasn't charged with attempted murder. Yeah, I mean, I didn't see anything to say why. But, I mean, Diana was at... Because, obviously, again, the part of the documentary, her, her sister, and the woman that's been interviewed in the documentary, they obviously must have all been in court that day because there's a bit in the documentary that shows them in, like, a taxi or something afterwards talking about it. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, they're over the moon. Like, they're really, mm-hmm. really happy with the charge. I mean, Diana herself's, like, really happy about it. You know, her sister's sort of crying... A bit with sort of sad, happy tears, if you know what I mean. And mm-hmm. they're obviously really chuffed with that sentence. But I guess, as I said, you know, for that charge, it's obviously really good. But I just mm. thought for... I just thought... There must be reasons why it wasn't for... Att- she didn't get attempted murder, but... Yeah, exactly. So, I obviously, that, you know, that was... I think that, obviously, that was a few years ago now. So I looked up some recent pics. And I have to say how amazing she actually looks now. Um... You know, but our body is still terribly scarred. But mm. our, you know, her face looks amazing now. Does like, it? Yeah, she looks. She's honestly looks. Her beautiful looks. You know, her back. Not, oh, so not good. It's not completely back to what she had pre being burned, mm. but she actually looked really stunning for you mm. know considering oh, what good. her body had been through. Yeah, I'm glad. I mean, obviously her actual body i mean you know their the scars are just like there you can't get away hiding from them but with her face i know probably like a bit of makeup and stuff does, does well with hiding the scars and yeah. stuff like that but you know she just looks so so good um and i think now she kind of advocates you know talking you know does talks and things about or what she's been through and i think yeah. i think she's maybe wrote a book as well um about her experience and stuff like that but i mean <sighs> I'm just amazed she survived, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, from, from the pictures that I saw and from hearing what actually happened, I mean, it's amazing that she's actually where she is today. Like, she just looks absolutely brilliant. And, you know, like, she's got a nice blonde hair back. And 
Oh, well, that's good. You know, she just she just looks absolutely amazing. So I mean, I just I just can't believe how anybody would want to ever do that to anybody. I mean, it's no matter disgusting. what, no matter what is going on in your life, and you know, I know like, you know, in relationships can get messy and. But in this yeah. case, nothing was happening. Well, exactly. I mean, nothing was happening. Like nothing actually happened. There was nothing. There was no fear. There was no kissing or there was anything. Just nothing. There was just yeah. nothing there. I mean, like I said, Eden wasn't even hitting on Dana at all. It was absolutely nothing. It was just two people having a chat at a New Year's Eve party that led to that. That's actually really scary mm-hmm. to think that you you can't even you have to be careful about who you're talking to. Because you don't know. Well, exactly. I mean, because like I say, Dan, I was just innocently talking to this guy. He probably didn't even think anything of it after the conversation. Because, I mean, I'm, you know. I'm you're just being sociable. You're at a party. You're just, exactly. you I chat mean, to people. That's it. I mean, many times we've probably been at parties or out in pubs, clubs, whatever, in our younger days now. <laughs> um, You know, I would talk to random strangers that yeah. I don't know, but it's just a conversation, an innocent conversation. Mm-hmm. And I went home probably not. Thinking about not, yeah, I just thought or... nothing of it and never seen that person again, never thought of that person again or think whatever. Natalia obviously had some serious issues anyway. I mean, yeah. she, you know, obviously wasn't happy if they were sort of she, separated. Yeah, I'm assuming that she had that Ed, Eden was Eden. his name. I'm assuming that he has maybe given her reason to not trust him. Yeah. But that true. doesn't mean to say that he's hitting on every girl that he meets and that doesn't mean to say that the, even if he is hitting on a girl, that that girl is responding to it so exactly the girl doesn't deserve i mean he wouldn't have deserved it either but like if you think that your husband is cheating go and confront him about it Mm -hmm. not exactly the girl go go and sort it out with him like yeah you know because it's it you've got any evidence yeah exactly this innocent girl has done absolutely nothing wrong and i mean i just can't believe how how it escalated to that (sighs) I mean, the, the I think certain, the drugs probably had a big. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, I think the drugs did definitely had a big, big thing, um, big, big part to play. But absolutely awful, and I mean, well, I'm glad that she that she's um, you know, yeah, I mean, that she's, she's okay. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, she is. I mean, she's obviously gonna probably, you know, I say her body's never gonna be the same again. I mean, obviously she's gonna be probably scarred mentally from it as well. I was but, gonna say the mental mm-hmm. um side of it. That's that's yeah. a lot. That would be a but lot I to think, get through. you know, looking at the pictures that I saw, she's obviously got to a point where she's probably feeling a lot better about herself just by her looks and stuff. But, you know, it's probably just a trauma that she's got to deal with every day of her life, isn't it? Yeah, I know. Okay. Oh, well, thanks for that. Yeah, you're welcome. So thanks, everybody, for listening. And if you'd like to get in contact with us, our inf- contact information will be in the show notes. And hopefully you'll be back to join us next week for our next episode. Yeah. So thank you very much and we'll see you soon. Bye.